Well, good morning again, church. Thank you for joining us as we come together in worship. And what a difference a week makes, right? As we spoke last week on Palm Sunday, as Jesus was entering into the city, he comes in under shouts of Hosanna and praise to the king of, and praise to kings and all of this. He comes in celebrated. Yet, as we talked about last week, it wasn't going to be long before he heard the words crucify him. And so we think before we get to the empty tomb, we, I wanted us just to spend a couple of minutes looking at that last week of Jesus' earthly ministry. And just a couple of key facts in here as we think about what's going on with Christ, right? We know that coming up to the resurrection, they're going to celebrate Passover. He's going to take his disciples into the garden and he's going to begin to pray. And at that moment, as he's praying, he's betrayed for pieces of silver. But even before that betrayal, when he's sharing the, the first Lord's Supper that we will partake in a, a time of that today as well. As he's delivering that first Lord's Supper, he looks at his betrayer and tells him, go do what you're going to do. Go. Go do what it is you're going to do. So Jesus, knowing that the one who was going to betray him was in the room with him, knowing what that betrayer was going to do, told him to go and do what it is he was going to do. So Jesus goes to the garden, he's arrested, he's put on a mock trial, which is laughable at best of what he's accused of. And, and one of the things I've marked, or one of the things I thought about with this is, what was he arrested for? Like, if we really truly think about, what is it? What are the charges that they arrested Jesus for? Well, if you were to ask the leadership at the time, the religious leadership, why is it that you arrested Jesus one of their answers would have been, well, he worked on the Sabbath. To which the reply for us as believers would be, you know what? They're right. He did. He worked on the Sabbath. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He fed the hungry. He offered himself to people. He sacrificed of himself on the Sabbath. But yeah, you're right. You know, he did work. He did some stuff. They would have said that he was a false prophet, that he was declaring himself God. They would have been just as right on that one, except for the fact that he could back up every single thing he said. He completed every single prophecy told of the Messiah. But they're right. He did declare himself to be God. But he was right. And he held up every end of it. And what did he get for this? What did Jesus get for fulfilling the prophecies of the Messiah, for being the perfect, sinless offering that came on behalf of humanity? Well, those that should have been shouting his praises and proclaiming to the world that Messiah had come, had him arrested. Then they drug him before the earthly king of the time, of the area, Pilate. They drug him in front of Pilate for judgment. And even the worldly leadership at the time, if you read through the story, says what? Can't find any fault in him. As far as the earthly leadership was concerned, Jesus was innocent. There was no fault in him to be found. And so the worldly leadership, and this is where I would pick up at Mark 15, verse 6. It says at the festival, it was Pilate's custom to release for the people a prisoner they requested. There was one named Barabbas who was in prison with rebels who had committed murder during the rebellion. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do for, to do for them as was his custom. So Pilate answered them, do you want me to release the king of the Jews for you? For he knew it was because of the envy of the chief priests that handed him over. And so we see here, even Pilate knowing that Jesus is innocent and that this earthly religious leadership is just envious and jealous of him, the earthly leadership, Pilate here decides, well, obviously if I offer them up a convicted murderer and Jesus, they'll pick Jesus. Because why would they knowingly release a murderer? But if we think about anything with humanity, we don't typically do what people expect, right? Humanity does its own thing. And so we see in verse 11, but the chief priest stirred up the crowd so that he would release Barabbas to them instead. 
One of the things, if you study humanity, is there is a such thing as groupthink. That without someone taking leadership in a situation, if one person stands up and says something, a group will follow almost unknowingly. That's why if you've ever taken a CPR or a first aid class, you know that if someone has to go call 911, you don't just shout to the crowd, hey, somebody call 911. If you've taken a CPR class, you know what is it that you do if someone has to call 911? You pick someone, you point at them, and you designate them, even if you don't know their name. So for example, if it was in here, I would use his name. I would point. I would say, Joseph, you. Or if I didn't know his name, I would point. You, with the glasses and the blue button-down shirt, go call. You designate someone. Because what we know about humanity is that if you don't, if you just shout to the crowd, hey, somebody do it, most people will say what? Somebody else will do it. Somebody else will take care of it. And in lack of someone taking leadership in a situation, when the chief priest stands up and says, crucify him, well, he's a person of position. The people there are too afraid to go after him, too afraid to say anything against him. So what do they do? They begin to shout right along with him. And they call for the crucifixion of Christ. If you know the story of the crucifixion of Christ, it's at this point that Pilate washes his hands and says what? His blood is not on my hands. You asked for this to happen. Christ after that is led away where he's mocked and beaten by the military. His clothes are sold off, which was prophesied about him. They place a purple robe on him and a crown of thorns and fake worship him as they walk him through the town. Later, he's nailed to a cross and put between two criminals. It was common that they would put the charge of the accused over the top of their cross during the crucifixion. Jesus has simply said, the king of the Jews. So ultimately, in the eyes of the state, he was arrested and crucified for being the king of the Jews. We know through the story of Christ hanging on the cross, he says a few words. Some of the most important words he says are to one of the criminals he's crucified with. That when that criminal looks at him and says, I deserve this, you don't. Remember me when you enter your kingdom. And Christ looks at him and says what? Today... You will be with me in paradise. Even in the midst of his death, even in the midst of his sacrifice, continuing to see the hearts of people who would give their life to him and offer them salvation. So why was Jesus arrested? What was he crucified for? As we've seen there, the hope is that we would be so bold that someone would arrest us under the same charges. This person just won't stop talking about God. This person won't just stop witnessing. That's why when we look at the New Testament, we look at the disciples later on, if we looked at all of their earthly ministries after the fact, where all of them, all of them are martyred for the faith except for John, and that's just because God wouldn't let him go because he needed to write Revelation. It wasn't for lack of effort. They tried multiple times. It just wouldn't take. But all of them were tortured and persecuted because of their relationship to Jesus Christ. And every time the world threatened them with death, every time the world said, stop preaching the gospel of Jesus or we'll kill you, their answer was always the same. Yes, please. Because if we die for this faith we have in Christ, we gain heaven. And that's the ultimate reward. We look at the crucifixion of Christ continuing into Mark 15. And it says around noon, darkness comes over the land until three in the afternoon. And at three, Jesus cries out, Elohi, Elohi, lema la sabatini. Which if you speak Hebrew, you would realize that is Psalms 22, verse 1, which translates out to, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And what we believe in this scripture is that this is the moment where God was no longer able to face Jesus as he had faced him before. Because to this point, the relationship between God and Jesus, there was no separation. They were firmly still connected, but as Jesus takes on the sins of the world, there comes a point 
where God can no longer continue to have that connection with Jesus as he takes on the sins of humanity. And this is the first time that Jesus experienced the separation from God that we experience today. And you could hear, I mean, if we could go back and listen, you would be, probably be able to hear the heartbreak in Jesus' words as he says that. Why have you forsaken me? When he's experiencing that separation for the first time, it's not long after that that we hear that Jesus takes his last breath. But even before all of that, he speaks and says, Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. That in the midst of everything he was going through, we were still on his mind. Humanity, his Creation was still on his mind and everything that was going on. So as we sit here today and we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have to remember that each and every single one of us crossed his mind while he was on there. So the question becomes sometimes for people, what was Jesus, what could have Jesus been thinking about on the cross? Well, it's an easy answer. He was thinking about you. You were on his mind. While he was there. As he was being crucified, chances are he would have thought of you by name. Matt was on his mind. Tony was on his mind. Sean. Erlene. Fiona. We were on his mind while he was there. He offered himself on behalf of a people that couldn't do it on their own. And those people are us. The good news is, the great news is, the reason we're gathered here today is this. The story does not end there. Because as we said earlier, the world wanted the story to end right there. The world wanted to crucify him and place him in a tomb and put a big rock in front of it with guards and say, that's it. We have removed this person. He is gone. He is no longer going to be an issue. And we can get back to life as usual. The world wanted that to be the end of the story. It did not realize that Sunday was coming. And if that was just the end of the story, then we wouldn't be here today. If the end of the story was Christ crucified on the cross then there would be no reason for us to be here today because there's still a prophecy to be fulfilled. He still has to return. As he had said, he has to return. So we get to Mark chapter 16. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, the mother of Mary, James, and Salome brought spices so they could go and anoint him, which was common practice. We'll pause here for a minute. I like to give you some of the history. This was common, right? We didn't have embalming like we had today. If you wanted to keep someone from getting, as they say in the good old King James, stinketh, you would go anoint the body for as long as you could to keep it smelling somewhat fresh. Until such a time that you couldn't anymore. And if it was someone very special to you, someone in the family that you cared about greatly, you would do it for as long as you physically could stomach it before you'd stop. And so they're trying to go do this for Jesus. And so we see in verse 2, very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they went to the tomb at sunrise. They were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone from the entrance to the tomb for us. Because as we know, the Romans had moved a stone in front of the tomb because they were afraid that someone was going to steal the body and cause dis disruption, cause problems. And if you think about the Roman Empire in the day, they were really an empire that just, they didn't care what you did as long as you left the empire out of it. Right? If you became a distraction or a problem, they were going to wipe you out. But if you just went about your business and lived your everyday life, you pay your taxes to Rome, you go to war when they tell you to go to war, they were cool with you. They were worried that Jesus and his followers might take the body, that they would take Jesus' body, and they would begin to rile up people in the empire, and it might lead to a civil war. So they put a stone in front of the tomb to prevent this, and they put guards. Now, of course, these ladies going there wondering, how are we going to get past this door? There's something we have to Notice they didn't go, well, there's a rock, so we're not going to go. They're just wondering how it's going to work once they get there. Four, looking up, they observed that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. 
Which you can imagine, if you're those ladies coming up to the tomb, you'd have to wonder, right? What's happened? Now we know from, from some scripture, from some thoughts, that they believed that his body had been stolen. That someone had come in and come in and taken the body and gone off with it. But as we look at Mark 16, we get this next little passage here, which is one of the most amazing passages of scripture there is. Not that the whole whole of scripture isn't amazing, but this little section right here is one of those that, again, I don't I know, if you underline or mark in your Bible, this is one of those to mark or underline. Starting at verse 5, when they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a long white robe sitting on the right side, and they were amazed and alarmed. Now, in the Greek, that was one word. So, we, again, in our English, we've separated out to amazed and alarmed. In the Greek, this was a combined word that was like we would almost view it today as astonishment or shock and awe, right? They were shockingly in awe of this thing they saw, this angel, this messenger of God that they're seeing. Uh, not necessarily an angel as we see in the New Testament, because again, if we do a deep, dark study on angels, you'll realize real quick, not the prettiest things in the world. But as we look here, they see this, they're amazed and alarmed. Verse 6, again, when something like this shows up, the most common phrasing afterwards, don't be alarmed, he told them. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. The next four words, so vitally important, right? He has been resurrected. Some of your scriptures might say, why do you look for the living among the dead? And as Joseph was alluding to earlier, that this living, this wasn't the fact, like you'll see people in the world today that say, oh, well, he just, he just wasn't dead when, he, when they took him off the cross. And if you heard earlier, right? If you heard our young man up there talking about it, that if they weren't real good at their job and what they did before he was on the cross, they would have killed him. When they flogged Jesus before the persecution, before the, the resurrection, excuse me, the crucifixion, they could have very easily ended his life right there. By the time he's nailed to the cross, he no longer looks like the person they knew beforehand. He was beaten severely, shredded, his body torn to pieces. The Romans were good at a few things. One of those things was killing people. They knew when someone was dead. When they took Jesus down off that cross, they knew He was dead. When they laid Him in that tomb, they knew He was dead. So if anybody ever comes to you and says, well, He just passed out. He just went to sleep. No. No. The Romans knew when somebody was dead. And so as Joseph said, when he came back, he didn't stumble out of there torn up. He didn't fall out of there beaten up. He completely renewed his own body. The electrical impulses in his brain that had stopped firing began to fire again. His heart began to beat again. The wounds on his body were healed. Because when the world thought they had won... Because they killed something, Jesus was going to show them who truly controlled death. He's going to truly show them who's in charge of this creation, who's in charge of this place. He's letting them know, letting us know. He's in control. Continuing in verse 6, it says, He is not here. See the place where they put Him? But go tell his disciples and Peter. He is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you. And I can almost imagine, you know, we read this and part of me wonders if there's not just a hint of sarcasm coming from this messenger, right? Like almost going, why did you even come here? Right? He told you. He told you. He wasn't going to be here. Yet here we are. Go to the place He told you would be. And guess what? He'll meet you there. Right? You can almost imagine it as a parent, right? Uh, when you're talking to a child and you've told the child, hey, go to this place and it's waiting on you. And then they look at you. Well, it's not there. Did you go? No. What are you waiting on? 
So you can almost imagine, I, I imagine here sort of that thought of why did you come here? He's, he's not here. He told you. He told you what was going to happen. So I think about that for us today is we await the return of Christ because we're told very clearly that he is going to come again. Yet so many of us will walk around thinking, oh, it's not going to happen. And then when it does, there's going to be a lot of shocked people going, what do you mean it happened? What do you mean? What do you mean? He told you. He told us it was going to happen. How are you surprised by this? Right? One of the things in, in my teaching life, it's always funny, right? You may tell kids that there's a test coming, right? And you can ask any one of my students. I give them plenty of at least a week's warning of a test, but it never fails. Day of test, what happens? What do you mean there's a test today? Told you a week ago. Why are you acting surprised? I imagine the same thing will happen when Christ returns. And what do you mean he's coming back again? He told us he was going to. Don't be surprised. He maintains every single one of his promises. Don't be surprised when he does it again. I'm going to jump forward to verse 14 in Mark because I believe this is one of the most important things that Jesus says to the disciples and to us before his ascension. And he saves it right, right at the end. Later, he appears to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table. He rebuked their unbelief. And hardness of heart because they did not believe those who saw him after he'd been resurrected. We know that when the women came back, they sort of scoffed at them and mocked them. And, you know, well, you know, how did he come to you or this? And so Jesus gets after them for that because they should have known too. Uh, then he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And so we think about what do we do with Easter, right? Like, what do we do at the end of this? The resurrection of Christ. We celebrate the resurrection. We rejoice in the resurrection. But what do we do with it after that? We follow Mark 16, verse 15. We go into the world and preach the gospel. We go and tell the goodness of Jesus Christ. We go and tell of the resurrection. We go and tell of the sacrifice of Christ. Because it's what we're told to do. There's no greater gift that we can offer someone on Easter Sunday than to tell them about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and what it means for us as a people group. That it gives us the opportunity for salvation. That it gives us the opportunity to put our faith and belief in a perfect Holy Savior, the only one who could come and live completely the law to fruition. The only one who could come and be sacrificed on our behalf. The only one, the only one who could conquer death. The only one who looked at Lazarus in the tomb and said what? Get up, let's go. The only one who upon his own death said no. No. And walked out of the tomb in full power. And stayed until he completed his work and then ascended in his own power. People try to say, oh, Jesus' life was taken from him. It was not. He willingly gave it up. Nothing was taken from him. He chose to offer himself on our behalf. And then when his time and his ministry was complete, he ascended back and sits today at the right hand of God, waiting to hear the words, go get my bride. And that's where he waits right now. We know at some point he's going to hear those words. And the trumpet's going to sound and he's going to descend and he's going to come for his bride, which is his church. It's not if, it's when. He keeps his promises. And so church today, as we celebrate this Resurrection Sunday, in a few moments when we partake in this Lord's Supper, if you're here today and you've never accepted him as Lord and Savior, he's the one. So many people searching for the thing, right? What's the thing that's going to sustain me? What's the thing that's going to make me better? What's the thing that's going to help me become a better person? He's the one. 
Now, I'm not promising you sunshine and rainbows. Don't think today that if you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, that magically your life is going to get better the second you walk out these doors, because that's not how it works. He doesn't take away your struggle like that. There are still going to be problems. There are still going to be issues. I was at a funeral Friday of a believer. There was still pain and hurting in that family, but there's also rejoicing in the fact that that person walked into heaven and heard the words, welcome, good and faithful servant, because Jesus keeps his promises. So if you're here today, you've been searching for that thing, you're not going to find it. You won't find the thing that sustains you. You won't find a thing that makes you better. Not forever. Jesus. Relationship with Him is the answer. That's what you've been searching for. He's that spirit of living water that you need in your life. So in a few moments, if you've never made that public declaration of faith, you've never accepted Him as Lord and Savior, I encourage you, come. Take me by the hand. Let's talk. Let's pray. Let's begin that relationship. Begin that path of discipleship. Maybe you're here today and you find yourself kind of like the 11. The heart's hardened. You're struggling a little bit. Maybe today's that day that you kind of hear what Jesus said, right? What was it? Go into the world. Preach the gospel. Notice he didn't say, hey, you, you, and you. He didn't say six of you do it, six of you. He said, go. The path, and when we look at this, and so often when we look at the Great Commission, in the American church, we move the emphasis. The emphasis in the American church so often falls onto the go. And the Great Commission becomes a passage that just tells people, hey, go preach the gospel overseas. Go preach it somewhere else. The emphasis, when we look at this in the Greek, when you study this in the Greek, the emphasis is on preach the gospel. If we really read this more like what the Greek said, it would be preach the gospel to the whole of creation. And when you can't make any more disciples where you are, when you can't preach to anybody else where you are, go. Preach the gospel to the whole of creation. So if we can't make disciples where we're sitting right now, how are you going to make disciples somewhere else? Preach the gospel. Not hire a guy to preach the gospel. Not bring him to the guy who's paid to preach the gospel. You, us, we as a people group, preach the gospel. So as believers, what do we do today with this? We preach the gospel. We tell people about the promise of Jesus Christ. My challenge to you is whatever God is moving and working in your heart, I pray that you would be open and attentive and you would come and come quick. With that in mind, let us pray. God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the promise keeper that you are. That you told us that you would come, you would, be, you would be sacrificed on our behalf, but three days later you would rise and you held to those promises. And we know that because you hold to those promises and so many others, that when you say in your scripture that you will return again, we know we can take it to the bank that you will return. God, I pray that if there's one in this room that hasn't yet stepped out in faith, there's, not, there's one that hasn't yet accepted you as Lord and Savior, that today they would step out and admit their need for you, that we can't handle this sin condition on our own. We can't handle our struggles on our own. We have to have you. God, we know that the world has misquoted that scripture in Corinthians that says God won't give you more than you can handle, where the truth of it is, God, you don't give us more than we can handle through you. That because of our relationship to you, we can endure the things that happen. And that without that relationship, we have no hope of enduring the struggles of this world. So God, I pray that if there's one in this room who hasn't yet accepted you as Lord and Savior, that today might be the day they accept. Today might be the day they begin that relationship. God, for us as believers, I pray that we would heed your example, the Great Commission, that we would go preach the gospel to anybody who would listen. That we would share who you are. We would share the truth of your goodness, of your mercy, of your grace. Because you're the only one. You're the only one. It's in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Stand with us, church.